I have grown up my whole life with the music ministry of Henry and Bunny Reed. It was a privilege to have you here today. What a blessing again. Thank you. It's good to be home. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> I got caught in this corner over here with that question too, so um, I promise you I have uh, been advocating on behalf of Springtown at the conference office, and they've heard from me a lot about that, so uh, I see in your announcement sheet, though, it looks like uh, uh, the president's going to be here in a few weeks, so uh, I'd say talk with him. <laughs> Elder Dye. I just want to say I've been very impressed with him as president. He came on April 1st, and uh, what I have seen him do and the, the things that he's moved and how he's brought his own personality into that office, I've been very impressed. And he's, he's won my respect, and I, I, I know you'll enjoy working with him as our conference president. <laughs> he's doing a great job. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the dowry system that you find in the Bible. We're going to be talking about weddings. And I've been sharing this, the, this sermon for the last two or three months. The advantage of working in the conference office is that when you go from church to church each week, you can use the same sermon over and over again. And I've shared this about 20 times, so hopefully I know it well enough today, but um, it's, uh, it's ironic that uh, we get to come together and uh, talk about weddings here in a district where, as I reflected back, had some of my most unique weddings as a pastor. Uh, for example, shortly after I got to this district, I can remember the hottest wedding I ever attended was an outdoor wedding over by Bentonville. And I can tell you, I sweat it more in those few minutes than I did almost any other time. Uh, the loudest wedding happened over here in a hay barn when a thunderstorm blew through right, right in the middle of the service and you couldn't hear anything except the pounding on the tin roof. Uh, the shortest notice I ever had for a wedding happened where I got called on Wednesday and said we'd like to get married Friday. And it was also the most casual wedding here in the church. And the quickest service time that I ever had was the last wedding out here in the pavilion. It was from start to finish, everything less than 15 minutes long. And that was, that was what they wanted. And so some of the, the most interesting weddings have been here in this district. But I want to tell you, talk to you a little bit about something that you find in the Bible. It's an aspect of God's love that um, when you talk about God's love, it's like picking up a diamond that has been cut. And, and when you pick it up and you turn it and you look at it from different angles, you get beautiful lights, you get beautiful colors coming out of it. And today we're going to pick up God's love, and we're going to turn it just a little bit and examine it from an aspect that we don't often look at, but yet the Bible shares with us. And it's the idea, this, this thought, that God's people is called his bride, and Jesus is called the bridegroom. And we're going to look at that and, and compare some things that we see in Bible traditions with weddings, the arranged marriage and the dowry, and see if we can't apply it spiritually to our relationship with Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Paul, Paul begins here writing in this little area. He says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And what he's saying is, is, hang in here with me. I've got something I want to share with you. Now in verse 4, he points out the fact, you listen to all kinds of other people who aren't telling you the truth. At least listen to me, I'm telling you the truth. So he's saying, bear with me a little bit. And he says, I'm going to do a little boasting. That folly is some boasting. And he goes on, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
So Paul is kind of saying that in some ways he has taken on the role of matchmaker between the Christians there in Corinth and Christ. And he says, I have brought you together. It's like an engagement. He's going on to tell them, you need to be faithful. Just like if you were engaged to, to another person, you wouldn't be going out and going on dates with other people and hanging out with other people while you're engaged, or you shouldn't be. And he, and he says, this is the way it works with Christ. When you have come to Christ, just one, one relationship is all you need. And so he says, I've betrothed you. I've brought you together with Christ. This idea of an engagement or a marriage. In the Bible, you find some, a number of marriages. We're going to examine one in Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24, the engagement of Rebekah to Isaac. It's quite the story. And within it, you're going to find the dowry system hinted at. Now, the dowry in the Bible can come in two different ways. You will have the bride price, and that is what the groom is willing to give to the bride's family on behalf of her. It was a way to recognize and say, she is valuable to you. I realize that she is valuable to your family. And when we get married, she is going to come and most likely, usually what happened was she would join his family and live on his family farm and become part of his uh, family. And he's saying, I want to recognize the fact that she was valuable to you. And so the bride price was something that was paid by the groom for the bride. But also the dowry has another aspect, and that would be when the family gives something to their daughter, their sister, something to go with her into marriage. And it's almost like an inheritance in some way. It was a dowry, and they said, here is something valuable to help you in marriage. And so there were two aspects of the dowry, and you see both of them in the story. Now, Genesis chapter 24, we will pick up in verse 50, but let me set up the story until we, we get there. Abraham's son Isaac became of age, and it was time for him to get married. But Abraham looked around at the community he was in. They had moved to Canaan. It was a, it was a land God had led him to and promised to his descendants, but at the time was filled with many people that did not believe in or fear God the way Abraham did. And he said, I don't want to choose a wife from someone amongst our neighbors. Uh, Abraham was wise in saying, I need to choose a wife that follows God the way, uh, the way Isaac follows, the way our family follows, that understands that. And the reality is, is it's still good advice for us today. That when we choose spouses, if we can choose spouses that are walking the direction we are spiritually, the family home is happier. And there's less stress. And so Abraham comes to his uh, highest uh, employee, his servant, and he says, I have a job for you. I want you to go and journey across the desert to my, to my homeland, to my family, where they fear God, and I want you to find a wife for my son Isaac. Now imagine if your employer, your boss, came to you and said, this is the job I want you to do. What a job. What a task. The, the servant agreed to this and said, I will do this. But Abraham was wise when he chose this servant because he also trusted in God. And you find that after the servant and a number of others and a whole bunch of camels made their way across the desert, as he was coming close to Abraham's homeland, the servant begins praying to God. And he says, God, this is bigger than I can do. How can I choose this? I, I can't do this. He says, so I'm going to ask for a very specific sign. When I come to Abraham's hometown, it will be about the time in the evening when the young ladies come out to draw water for their families and to take care of things. And he says, if there is someone, one of those ladies, who offers to water our camels, then I will know she is the one that is for Isaac. Now, young people, I see a number of you guys here. Help me out with this. When you think about camels going across the desert, when they find water, do you think they drink just a little bit? Or do they drink a lot of water when they get an opportunity? Tell me about camels. Kids? A little or a lot? 
A lot of water. That's exactly right. Camels can really drink. You know those big humps? There is storage for water. And they can really tank up on it. So now imagine what the servant is asking God for. He's looking for a woman who has an incredible gift of hospitality. The fact that she is willing to look at a stranger and said, can I do this amount of work for you? And yet, that's what he asked, and that's what he got. Because as he was outside the city by the well, the young ladies came out. Rebecca looks up, sees the stranger's caravan, more than one camel, and says, may I draw water for your, car uh, your camels? And the servant says, yes. And I can't imagine what he was doing inside his heart. What would you do when you get such a direct answer to prayer like that? But I'm sure he is excited on the inside because he's going, this is the one and God answered my prayer. And so he allows her to do this. And it says that she drew water until the camels stopped drinking. I don't know how long that would be, but she did it until the job was done. Well, the servant gets off, you know, off the camel. He's there. And to say thank you, he begins to give her gifts. The gifts initially are gifts of gratitude. Thank you for this, what you, this gift of hospitality. But then he says something. He says, you are an answer to prayer. And then he explains why he's there, what he had prayed, and how she was a direct answer to prayer. And now she's got to be kind of blown away. What do you do when somebody tells you, you were an answer to my prayer? That's a, that's a very humbling thing to be in. And so she doesn't say no. She, she simply says, you've got to come and talk with my family. And so she invites them home, and now she meet, he meets their family. And this is where he goes through the whole story again in chapter 24, uh, talking to the family about the, where he came from, why he was there, his prayer, how she was an answer. And verse 50 is where we pick up the story. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing comes from the Lord, and we cannot speak to you either bad or good. They said, if this is from God, and it looks like it's an answer to prayer, we're not going to stop it. We're not going to get in the way of this. If this is God's doing, then we want to follow God's will. So they go on to say, Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be your master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. Now, in a few verses, you're going to see she's given an opportunity to say yes or no. But right now, they are at least acknowledging the fact that we're open to this. If this is God's doing, then fine, here she is. She's available for you to take. Verse 52, And it came to pass, when Abraham's servant heard their words, that he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth, then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold and clothing, and he gave them to Rebekah. Now, this isn't thank you for watering my camels, but now this is you are valuable and we're going to treasure you and this is how we're going to start to show you. It's like getting a big engagement ring. And then it goes on to say, he also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Now, he doesn't say what it is here, but this is that dowry to the family, the bride price. Now, we're going to come back to this story, but there's some interesting other bride prices besides possessions that are given in the Bible. If you turn over a little bit to Genesis chapter 29, you will see that another person, it's Rebecca's son, Jacob, has come across the desert again. He got in trouble at home with his twin brother and he pulled some shenanigans and he had to leave home. He made his way across the desert. He's come back to the same area and he fell in love with Rachel. And he wants to marry Rachel, but he doesn't have anything to give for a bride price. So his future father-in-law says, well, you can work for me. And how long, if you know the story, did they agree to work, did he agree to work for Rachel? Seven years was the initial contract, right? And at the end of the seven years, there was a switcheroo at the wedding. I can't explain it, but he wakes up and found that he was married to the wrong woman. He wants Rachel, not her older sister, Leah. His father-in-law says, fine, you can have Rachel also if you'll work for how much longer? Seven more years. So the deal was 14 years, you get two wives. Uh, what a deal. <laughs> and so it was a bargain, I guess because he went ahead and did that deal. You know, for those who have thought that uh, multiple spouses is a good idea, just read the Bible. It's not. It brings a lot of heartache to the, the, the family there. 
But you see that you could work for the bride in, in putting in time. Another place, and probably the strangest thing that you find for a bride price, is found in 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 25 through 27. Now, you don't have to put this on the screen. I'm not even paying attention if you are, but don't put this one on the screen because it's really strange and we'll save the kids. But for those who are old enough, you can go look. It's in the Bible. David wants to marry um, King Saul's daughter. And King Saul really didn't like David. And so King Saul says, you don't have to work for me you, per se. You don't have to put any possessions. Here's the deal. If you want to marry my daughter, I want you to go and fight against the enemies of Israel. I want you to kill 100 Philistines and bring back the evidence. You can read what it is. It's the strangest bride price there is. Well, he says this because he really hopes that David will be killed in the process. But um, God was with David, and as he fought against the enemies of Israel, he didn't just kill 100 Philistines, he killed 200 Philistines, and he brought back the evidence, which you can read about in 1 Samuel 18, verse 25 through 27, strange bride price. A more modern story was told in the 1960s uh, Woman's Day magazine. It was picked up and retold again in the 1980s in Reader's Digest. It was made into a couple of movies also, um, and maybe you have heard the guy's name that was in it called Johnny Lingo. You can Google Johnny Lingo for this story, but it goes something like this. Uh, they lived in the Polynesian Islands out in the Pacific Ocean. Their culture practiced away, arranged marriages and bride prices. And most of the time in their culture in these islands, uh, a young lady, with the bride price would be some type of animals or livestock. A going rate for a young lady might be between one and three cows on average. If you were poor, maybe it was less. If she was a princess, it could be even four or even almost unheard of five cows. But this is the kind of culture he was living in. Now, Johnny Lingo was a good businessman. He was known in the islands for his ability to do deals, and, and he seemed to have a knack of negotiating, and he, he really was doing well as a businessman. And he could acquire all kinds of goods for those in the area. And um, when he was traveling one time, he went to another island and saw a young lady on the island there that he fell in love with, that he wanted to marry. But there was something interesting about this young lady. Her family had really looked down on their daughter and sister, and they really had begun to tell her these things that some people will do, and that is, they used to say, you're really not worth that much. You're, you're really not that pretty. You're really not that smart. And they begin to suggest that if we are ever lucky enough to marry you off, uh, which will be lucky for us, we probably won't get much for you in a bride price. And they had been telling her long enough that she had actually started to believe this thing. And, and so she didn't walk usually looking up at people, but she walked with her head down somewhat slumped over. She, she didn't really care for herself the way she could because she believed what she was told about her value. Now, this is the young lady that Johnny Lingo sees, but he sees beyond the surface, and he sees somebody who had good character and a good heart. Well, when Johnny Lingo's future father-in-law, who had been talking to his daughter this way, heard that Johnny Lingo was interested in her, he, he thought to himself, well, that makes sense. Johnny Lingo is such a good businessman, he is looking for a bargain in a wife. And, and so his father-in-law thought to himself, he says, when Johnny comes to negotiate, I'm going to ask for two cows. But I know that I'm going to lose this negotiation and I can only hope that I will end up with a cow for this daughter. And so this is how they came into the negotiations when Johnny came to visit his future father-in-law. But Johnny Lingo came in and he said to his future father-in-law, I am going to offer a price for your daughter and it is not up for negotiation. And the father-in-law is like, ah, I knew it. I knew this was going to happen. And so he braced himself and, and Johnny said, I want to offer for your daughter 
eight cows. And his, father, his future father-in-law paused for a moment, thought he misunderstood. Could you repeat that again? How many cows? Eight cows. In their culture, no one had ever paid eight cows for anyone. Not even the princess had been paid eight cows for. Eight cows. And Johnny said, I am not negotiating. This is, this is all that I am offering, and we're not going to talk anymore about it. Well, of course, the father-in-law is elated. He can't believe it. And he thought that Johnny had lost his business sense. What was he thinking? Others begin to talk about it as they heard about it in the island. What was Johnny thinking? He's such a good businessman. He could have gotten her for such a bargain. What was he thinking? But they got married. The exchange happened. Eight cows, sure enough, showed up at the family farm. And Johnny brought his wife back to his own island. Now, the author of the story, she was traveling through the area uh, and they were going somewhere in the world, and they had stopped in these islands for supplies. And when she stopped, she began asking in the islands if there was somebody who could do business with them that could get them some more supplies for their journey. And she happened to stop at Johnny Lingo's wife's island first. And they all said, well, sure, Johnny Lingo lives on this other island. He's the man. He can get you all this stuff. But then they would snicker, and they would laugh. And they'd say, we're pretty sure, based on what's happened recently, you're going to get a good deal with him. Negotiate, I'm sure, because they were laughing about his deal with his bride. And, and as this author talked with others on the island, they all had the same story. And they were all laughing about Johnny Lingo and how, what was he thinking in his business. Well, she went over to his island. And sure enough, the same thing was happening over there. People were laughing at Johnny Lingo for having paid eight cows for this this girl. But finally, they directed the author to Johnny Lingo's hut or place of business, and she met Johnny Lingo. And they began to talk business. Yes, he could take care of all of her needs. Yes, no problem. He can get those things, and, and so on and so forth. And then he, sa he said, I've got to ask you a question. How did you hear about me? Well, I stopped on this island over here, and they told me about you. Oh, really? Did you know that my wife came from that island? Well, yeah, I actually heard about that. Really? Were they saying anything else? Well, and the author was a little embarrassed, but finally said, yeah, they are. They were talking about the price that you paid for your bride. Really? How much did they say? Eight cows. Well, that's right. And they're talking about that? Yeah. Oh, that's good, Johnny Lingo said. He said and then he asked, how about on my island? Has anybody mentioned it to you? And finally, the author said, well, to be honest, everyone's talking about it. And Johnny Lingo smiled and said, oh, that's good. And then he said, would you like to meet my wife? Well, of course, the author is now curious about all of this and the fact that he had brought it up. So he said, sure. And she said that when his wife came in and she brought some things to serve to them as they were talking, that she said it didn't appear like the girl that had been described in the other island. Because this girl stood tall. She had a sparkle in her eye, a smile on her face. She looked you in the eye, and, and she, she had a, a beauty about her. She was keeping herself up, and, and there was something special about her. And, and they had a wonderful conversation. Then finally she left, and, and, and Johnny Lingo began talking with this author and, said, um, and, and explained. He says, she, no one valued her, but I could see her value. And when she found out that I paid eight cows for her in the bride price, it changed her outlook on life. And she realized that she indeed was valuable. And now she's the most beautiful girl on the island, in my opinion. And the story goes so well with our relationship with Christ. Because Satan comes along like that girl's family and whispers things into our ears. And he says, you've messed up. You've blown it. Satan was there. He's the one who talked us into doing it, and then he puts it in our face. And he says, you're not worth much. How could heaven possibly like you? You're, you're, you're a sinner. You're ugly what you did. You should be embarrassed. And we begin to listen to Satan and what he says, and our heads are hung down, and we begin to stoop, and we begin not to care for ourselves because we listen to Satan and how he puts us down time and time again. But I want to tell you something that when we realize that the Bible calls God's people here on earth, and that's us, the bride of Christ, 
let me tell you about the price that, brought, uh, that Christ paid for his bride. Because it's an amazing price found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6. Chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm sorry, verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. We get a hint at it. It says here, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So it says that we've been bought at a price. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, it tells us what that price was. You see, for heaven, it wasn't gold or silver. Gold in heaven isn't worth a lot. It's used for pavements and other things, building materials. Pearls and precious gems aren't anything. That's the foundation to the New Jerusalem, and it's the gates. Have you ever thought about the size of the gates on the New Jerusalem? They're massive. The walls are 200 feet tall, and they've got these gates. And the gates are made out of a single pearl. I'm looking forward to seeing the oysters that God helped create, that created the pearl that was used for the gates, because those are massive oysters. But it wasn't any of those things. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the most precious thing in heaven was spent for the bride of Christ, for us. I'll start in verse 17, because it's the middle of the sentence. It says, And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear, and that means respect, knowing that you were not redeemed or bought or purchased with corruptible things like silver or gold, or from your aimless conduct, you can't earn it, you can't pay it, received by tradition of your fathers, but with what, church? The precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, innocent Christ, who died on our behalf. That is the price that Christ paid for his bride. It was the most precious thing of heaven, and it was poured out on our behalf. And when we realize that, as those who are engaged to Christ, the, the bride of Christ, we can begin to stand tall like Johnny Lingo's wife. We can look people in the eye. We can know that I'm valuable, and we can also know that they are valuable too. In Christ's eyes, that's how valuable we are. And we can start to smile and engage with one another from that perspective. But what about the other aspect of the dowry? The dowry, the gift given by the bride's father or family on behalf of her. It could be servants, property, money. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. We're back to the story of Rebecca here again, the servant. Now we'll look at Starting with verse 57, there's a debate. Servants ready to go right away. The family's like, no, let us have a couple of weeks. So they're going back and forth. But here's the question now concerning Rebecca, verse 57. So they called the young lady and they said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? So here's her opportunity. She's choosing. And she said, I will go. So they sent Rebecca, their servant, and this is now the dowry that's being given to her by her family. It says that they sent her nurse uh, along with her. Now, the nurse would have been the nanny that would have grown up, she would have grown up with, a person, an adult that she'd learned to trust. This person was sent with her to help her as she got adjusted to married life. She was there to advise, to be a, a voice for, on behalf of the family as Rebecca now goes to make her home with Isaac. The nurse is there with her. This is the dowry that is being sent. And if you look a little bit further in verse 61, you will see that Rebecca and her maids, plural. So more than just the nurse, there were other family employees that went with her and they would be permanently there with her. They weren't to return back there they would stay with her then through the rest of their employment with the family. And so they sent 
this help. Oh, you'll find dowries in the Bible. 1 Kings 9.16 tells that a city of Gezer was a dowry for Solomon's wife from her father, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. But I think the most interesting thing is to get right to the point, what is our dowry that we've received from our Heavenly Father? Because I'd like to suggest that there is one that has been mentioned. Now, of course, in John 3, verse 16, you see both. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so we see that. That's the bride price. That whoever believes in Him should not perish. But what is our dowry? We'll have everlasting life. So one of the things that we are promised right away is when we accept Christ in our lives, we have the assurance of everlasting life. Now, we may sleep for a while, but there is no fear of, of death because there is a resurrection. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. And so for God's people, we have the assurance of everlasting life. It is the dowry that is given to us when we've accepted Christ and we're engaged. But there is also another dowry that is given. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. This is also the middle of a sentence, so I'll start in verse 21. It says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us who or what? The Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So kind of like Rebecca received her nurse, her nanny, to come with her to help her, to advise her, we receive someone also, and that is the Holy Spirit. The reality is the Father's involved, the Son is involved, the Spirit is involved with salvation and with the Gospel. And it's good news for us. We're not left alone. And so we see the Spirit. You'll find it again in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14. I'll start in verse 13 because it's the middle of the sentence again. And him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is given to us right away when we accept Christ as our Savior. Now, the Holy Spirit comes to us in two different ways. One, He's constantly drawing us to come into a relationship with Christ. And when we come into a relationship with Christ, He's there to help us with that relationship the rest of the way through. But when we're baptized, the Holy Spirit is poured out in a special way not to help us overcome sin. Frankly, we'd never make it to baptism without the Holy Spirit. He's always been there with us. That Holy Spirit is being poured out so that we can lead others to Christ. At baptism, that's the purpose there of the Holy Spirit, is for ministry to others. So it's not that we did it on our own till we got to baptism, uh, and then we finally had the help of the Holy Spirit. We would never get there if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. But then there's a special pouring out for the work of ministry after baptism. And so that's kind of the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is the dowry given by the Father to us, the bride. Now there's a wedding coming. And you find it in Ephesians chapter 5, a description of that preparation for the wedding. When Sherry and I got married up at the College View Church in Lincoln, Nebraska, we followed a tradition that day that many of our contemporaries did, and I don't know, they probably still do somewhat today, maybe, you tell me. But the idea was this, that for fun that day, we decided that we would not see each other at the church until it was actually the wedding ceremony. So she was back in the mother's room there and she was getting ready and she could peek out the window and she actually could see me out there. She knew I was there. And I knew that she was in the building someplace, but we did not see each other. I did not see her until I was standing next to the pastor. There were the groomsmen on this side, the bridesmaids on this side, the organ changed, the doors opened in the back and there her and her father were standing to come down the aisle. And that was the first time that day I got to see her. And she was all fixed up, you know, her hair's done, the dress, beautiful, all those things. 
And it was a very emotional moment. I, I can still remember standing there and, uh, and trying to get a hold of my emotions. Mom was over there and she saw me about ready to lose it. And so she puts this handkerchief over the front pew so I would have something to blow my nose on. I'm like, no, no, I am not going to do this. I'll get it together. And, and so I tried to pull it together. But it was just at one of those moments because it was just beautiful and I can still see it if I close my eyes. But in Ephesians chapter 5, we see that Christ does not follow such a tradition. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 25, it starts this way. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, this is an amazing picture of what we see with Christ as we're getting ready as the bride for the wedding day. Because he is not standing back waiting for us to get ourselves ready in the back room. And when we finally got it figured out, we come out and present ourselves to him all cleaned up. If he waited like that, or if we tried to go forward with the ceremony, we would be a mess as a church. Our dress would be all messed up. Our hair would be all askew. There would be smudges and stains all over us because we can't do it on our own. And Christ doesn't leave us to do it on our own. But it says that He's back there in the room helping us get ready. Now, how does He do that? It says by washing us through the Word. We need to spend time in God's Word. Corporately, it's always good to come together like this and do this. But don't limit your exposure to God's Word to just time at church. We need to individually be spending time in God's Word. He speaks to us differently when we're having our private devotions than when we're together corporately. You need both. I I, I think we need to come together. The Bible says that. But we also need that private time. It's how He does it. He works through the Spirit. He leads us and guides us so that we are presented to Him without spot without blemish in verse 33 paul goes back and forth now he starts talking to marriages and he gives marital advice but he's also referring to spiritual advice between us and christ he comes back and he says now i've just explained this is between you and christ and this is how the church works and then he says to husbands here on earth 33 nevertheless let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself good advice And then he speaks to the wives, let us see that she respects her husband. And I would like to turn that now spiritually and go backwards with that. If Paul can do it one way, I'll go backwards with it. And that says that Christ loves us incredibly. He gave it all for us. That in response, we live our lives out of respect for what he has done for us. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Anything that I could say in the stewardship department would all fit under this concept of that we live our lives out of, what, out of respect and awe of what Christ has done for us. We should not live our lives thinking that we're going to get God to like us some way. If I just give a bigger offering, God will like me more. If I just do more volunteer work at church, God will like me more. If I just do all these things, maybe I can get into heaven. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches God loved us with an everlasting love and he poured out his whole everything, the most precious thing for our behalf. And then how we live our lives is out of respect for that act that already has happened. Does that make sense? And that's what I believe that we can learn from here is that we can respect the the, the groom for what he has already done on our behalf. In Christ Objects Lessons, page 205, this is good advice. It says this, Do not listen to the enemy's suggestion to stay away from Christ until you have made yourself better, until you are good enough to come to God. She says, if you wait until then, you will never come. Don't wait. Don't wait until you think you've got yourself figured out to be able to come to Christ. You need Christ to get yourself fixed. And so don't wait. Come and he will work with you. Oh, the good news is is that there's a day coming where Christ is going to come for His bride. He's going to sweep us off, uh, off our feet and carry us over the threshold into the heavenly home that He's preparing for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 gives us a description of that day. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll get there eventually. I'm sure they still left Thessalonians in my Bible. There it is. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Describes that day. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. I was down at Cub Camp a few weeks ago and I was talking to the kids and we got talking about this verse and I explained to them, this is the loudest verse in the Bible. It's this idea that Christ is going to come and, and, and share. And, and we had some noisemakers that we had handed out. And those kids got going on those noisemakers. And I'll tell you, it was the loudest noise I heard. We were inside a room because of rain and it was intense. And, and I wanted to impress upon them how wonderful it's going to be that day. But there's nothing quiet or secret about it. It says that he will descend with a shout, that's loud, voice of an archangel, I'm sure it's not timid, the trumpet of God, that's, that's one of the most broadcasting type of instruments in the orchestra. And it says, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. I think I skipped a sentence, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we'll get caught up. And it says that he sweeps us off our feet and he carries us over the threshold into the heavenly home that he's prepared for us. And he says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so we come to uh, the verse that I want to close with in Revelation 19. A scene of that day, I believe this is in heaven and John got a picture of it. A description, Revelation 19 Verse 6 through 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Though we know from Ephesians it's not without help. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the married supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Let me just share. The price has been paid, the marriage has been arranged, but we, like Rebecca, have been given a choice. The question is simple. Will we go with this man? My prayer is is that you will say yes. I will accept the invitation of Christ.